Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. To the millions of American men and women who have labored and today labor still with hand and mind and heart to build and to preserve a great free nation. The Cavalcade of America proudly dedicates the unending story of a new way of life in a new world. Tonight, for the first program in the new series of the Cavalcade of America radio plays, we take our story from the American historical drama The Lost Colony by the Pulitzer Prize dramatist Paul Green. Since its first performance on Roanoke Island, North Carolina, July 4th, 1937, The Lost Colony has taken a prominent place among the annual dramatic festivals of the nation. Margaret Leworth has especially written a radio play of The Lost Colony and the story of a woman in that valiant band of colonists, Eleanor Dare, whose daughter, Virginia, was the first English child born in the American colonies. For our star, we turn to Hollywood. She is charming Loretta Young, whose screen performances have delighted untold millions. Tonight, you will hear her as Eleanor Dare. And from our cavalcade players, you will hear Jeanette Nolan as Queen Elizabeth, John McIntyre as John Borden, Edwin Jerome as Sir Walter Raleigh, Ray Collins as Eleanor's father, Governor White, and Carl Swenson as Captain Dare. Our orchestra and musical effects are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, present the story of the lost colony on the Cavalcade of America. The hands of time spin back through the centuries. Back to a room in the great manor house of John White in Devon, England, a long time ago. Elizabeth was on England's throne. Eleanor. Oh, yes, Father? Daydreaming at the window again. I, I guess I am. It's the talk in the village. Talk? What talk? Well, ever since Sir Walter Raleigh came back, there's been talk of the New World, the island of Roanoke. Ah, oh, how I should love to see it. John Borden told me only today that he and 24 others are... John go- Borden, is it? Oh, no, Father. I only mean... Roanoke has cast a spell on... Daughter, I think you talk with John Borden too much. He is a manly lad and a good farmer, but... He is a tenant. Oh, that's not fair, Father. We've grown up together. Daughter, I understand these dreams of yours, the spell of the new world on you. But there are more practical matters to think about. I have news for you today. Yes, Father? My old and esteemed friend, Captain Ananias Dare, has asked your hand in marriage. Captain Dare? Yes. No finer gentleman in Devon. But, Father, I... Well, I, I respect Captain Dare, of course, but I... I don't love him. You talk like a schoolgirl. I announce your betrothal this week. It is your wish, Father. And Eleanor, you will not pass any more time with the uh, tenants, John Borden included. Father, we we are old friends. He is not of your rank, and you are no longer children. You are marrying well. Now listen to me. Captain Dare, too, is interested in the Raleigh expeditions. Next week, we all go to London. Queen Elizabeth holds court for Sir Walter. And you shall hear firsthand all the stories of Roanoke you want. Yes, Father, if you wish. Roanoke. It's only a daydream. Mr. 
Miss Eleanor. John Borden. Well, what brings you to court? The same that brings you, Mr. Eleanor. Are these wonders reserved for patrician ears? Oh, you know I didn't mean that. May I offer my congratulations on your betrothal? Captain Dare is a worthy man. I... I would you knew him better, John. I have small taste for that. Now, your pardon. I have an appointment with Sir Walter. Sir Walter? John, are you going to the New World? The Queen willing. On Roanoke Island, a man can be anything in his own right. Not because birth makes him so. I dream of the new land myself, John. <laughs> you? Hi. I fear the rocks and forests are rougher than our Devon Green. Oh, laugh if you will. But all the same, the New World needs women as well as men. Eleanor. Hi. Eleanor. Oh. oh. Servant, Captain Dare. Goodbye, Mr. Eleanor. Goodbye, John Borden. Well, my dear, is it quite fitting that you tarry here with one of your father's tenants? Mm -hmm. Oh, come. Now the Queen opens court and we should be with Sir Walter. Hear ye, our most gracious sovereign Elizabeth, by the grace of God of England, France, and Ireland, Queen and Defender of the Faith, to all people to whom these presents shall come, greetings. Unto my people, greetings. In honor of the new land, we hold feast today for all people present. So make you merry at the dance. <laughs> Sir Walter. Oh, Mr. Selenor White, Captain Dare. Your servant, Sir Walter. Shouldn't you two be dancing, Captain Dare? I have little time for dancing, Sir Walter. But now I crave your pardon. Uh, your father is beckoning. If you please, Ananias, I wish to speak to Sir Walter. Very well. Good day, Sir Walter. Good day, Captain. And now, my child, what is your wish? I... I wish to sail to Roanoke. You? I... You don't know what you're saying. Oh, in spite of everything, Sir Walter, I'd go. Ah, I wish the Queen will have the same mind. Sir Walter, I thought of nothing but Roanoke since the first I heard of it. Mistress Eleanor, I think it would be wise to present you to Her Majesty. Sir Walter. Come, my child. You make your bow. Your Majesty. Oh, Sir Walter. This expedition of yours seems to please the people well. For that, I am grateful, Your Majesty. But for all your efforts in the wilderness, what do I have? Gold? Silver? No. Two red-skinned creatures. A foul-smelling tobacco weed and a root not fit to eat. Ha! Lord of the potato, they call you. I and I bear no prouder title. We have an ancient foe, Sir Walter. Spain. I'll not waste men or purpose on some fancied wilderness with Philip ready to seize our island stronghold, if he dared. Sir Walter, your talk wearies me, but apparently not younger years. Your Majesty, may I present Mistress Eleanor White, betrothed to your most loyal subject, Captain Dare. Your Majesty. Rise, my child. Sir Walter, you choose wisely for your company, though a bit young. I find wisdom in the young. Your Majesty... None yearns more to the new land than Mistress White. Is this true? If England's men have dreams, so have her women, Your Majesty. Oh, mark you that, my lord. Oh, Your Majesty, I only know now, day and night. I have thought of nothing but this new world beyond the sea. What nonsense. Well, Sir Walter, I will settle this or there'll be no rest at all. You may send your colonists to Roanoke. Your Majesty. But... You shall not go. I know. I am reserved for Spain. For Spain. <laughs> However, a hundred men can be spared to build a fort on Roanoke Island. And your blessed women, too. If you can persuade them. We need no persuasion, Your Majesty, only your words. The hope, the dream is ours. <laughs> I have regretted these many weeks that I do not sail with you to Roanoke today. But my hopes and prayers go with you. Be true to John White, 
the governor of this colony, and to Captain Ananias Dare, who will be second in command. On Roanoke Island, you will find a port and men who have preceded you there. Convey to them my fondest greetings. And now to all of you, farewell and Godspeed. And you, my friend, John Borden, my hand. Thank you, Sir Walter. This Roanoke is like a dream. This golden light and this warmth. Oh, heaven indeed blesses our arrival. I hope so, child. <laughs> and, and yet it, it's so strangely still. Not even a bird. The men must be far away in the fields. The stockade ahead, sir. Father, see. They've built well. Company halt. All right, Borden. Knock. Governor White and party in the Queen's name. Gate swung ajar. Open it, Borden. He's dead. And a long time, sir. Oh. I see. The Indian method. Mm. They broke his bones. Oh, horrible, horrible. Eleanor, step back. Montiol. What does this mean? What is this? Indian, kill all white men in fort. White men must go. Tribe, make war. War? But we come in peace. Governor White, we can't stay here. We must. Have your men bury that man, Borden. We turn back at once. Oh, Father, wait, please. Listen to what me. What is it, my dear? Haven't you had enough? Father, Ananias, listen to me. We've come here with plows and spinning wheels. We've come to live in peace and build our homes. And with God's help, we can let us stay here. For the sake of the dream we've kept, and for the sake of the child that's coming to me. Please. We will stay. John Borden, unfurl the flag. And may this flag never fall, except as we fall first. Long live this blessed land of Virginia. My delight is in the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my prayer. Bless us, the people, O Lord, on this island of Roanoke, and to the child I am to bring forth, I beseech thee. Deliver me in thy love and service. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. men, go up to the north field and finish work. Humphrey, you take the group. Borden, you're not sending all these men to Mansfield. Spread them out. Captain Dare, the Indians are growing bolder every day. Last night they raided our grounds again. We don't dare let these men go out alone. Oh, absurd. You tell the Indians if they want to fight, we'll give it to them. We've come in peace. Captain Dare! Uh, Hi, Dame Coleman. What is it? Captain, dear, the baby's come. You and Mrs. Eleanor have a fine daughter. Oh, thank God. I'll come at once. Congratulations, Captain Dare. Well, thank you, Borden. Get the men to work. Better if white men go. Tribe never give up land. No, Montiel. This child is our omen. The white men will survive in this land. God, we are conscious of this great event, this the first English child to be born in the new world. I baptize thee, Virginia Dare, in the name of the Father. Governor White, the ship's captain's ready.
afraid to sail, sir. God be with you, Father. Friends. Friends, I sail today for England. But I shall return to you soon with shiploads of provisions and other men and women to add to our settlement. Until then, God be with you. Your hand. Jonathan, help me in the boat here. Your Majesty, more than a year has passed since I first petitioned you. Let me take two ships and save the colony. Master White, there is an old saying. A little thread can often save a rope from breaking. Perhaps these two tiny ships might be important links in the strand against the King of Spain. Your Majesty. Your Majesty, a messenger with urgent dispatch. Bring him to me. Let up, Your Majesty. Ha. Your Majesty? It seems that destiny makes the choice. Would heaven it did not in such a tragic way as this. Gentlemen, Philip has set his Spanish armada to sail against us. In this hour, no ship shall leave England. Mistress Dare, how is your husband? His wound was deep. But Mr. Martin says there is a chance. He's sleeping now. Oh, God, help us. You help. must be brave. Tonight is Christmas. In a little while, the Yule procession begins, and then you... How can we sing? No food in our mouths. I know. Our children sing. Oh, Mistress Dale, where is John Borden? He promised to bring us food. He's been gone these many, many weeks. He won't fail us. Go now. Go to the Yule log, and I'll join you very soon. God bless you, Mistress Dare. I... God bless you. Eleanor. Eleanor. I, I am right here. Eleanor. I would it had been different. Oh, hush, my dear. Life has been good to us. Eleanor. I... Come close. I can't see your face. Eleanor, yes. Listen, my dear. Has John Borden returned? Not yet. But he'll be back. Eleanor. The people will look to you... And John Borden. No. No, you mustn't talk like that. You will live to save us. You must not fail them, Eleanor. And when Borden comes back, tell him... Tell him... Ananias. Mr. Martin! Eleanor. Oh, my poor child. Eleanor. Mr. Martin, there's the procession. Don't let them come here. I, I, I can't, not now. I will tell them. No. No, wait a minute. He, he said I must not fail them. They shall have their Christmas. Tomorrow will be time enough. Uh, Mr. Martin, you will stay. I will watch for you. My baby. My baby's Christmas. My child, have heart. We shall win. Here is something for her. I give your baby this small Bible. See, I have written her name. Virginia Dare. Roanoke Island in Virginia. Christmas, 1588. This is my strength. starving, dying on our feet. Captain Deere has been in his grave these many weeks. I ask you, when, how, and where is this colony going to get help? John, you're worn out, but you must talk to them. I know, I will. Yeah. I say we break up this colony. Break it up. And go each for himself. Alone we can find food, find some friendly Indians. You right, you madman. You want to die, all of you, alone and horribly in the forest or at some Indian stake? I know you're hungry. So am I. 
But we must band together. I tell you, Montiel's friendly tribe has gone south to Croton. We can follow them. Follow the Indians. Don't listen to him. I say we go our own way. Find our own food. Oh, how kind you are. Listen to me. Go if you wish. But you haven't any right to take your women and children with you. For weeks, John Borden has searched in the wilderness. He learned more about this land and our chances than any of us know. If John Borden tells us to move together, we move. Tomorrow we shall talk it over. And I'll tell you how we can get through the winter together. But now, for just one night, I would rest. Let's go to our beds. No harm to wait a few hours more. Good night, men. Good night. God rest you, John Borden. Oh, oh, Listen. What's that? Oh, Quiet, everyone. Quiet. John Borden. John Borden. It's the sentry. Let him through there. John. What is it, man? John Borden, I... Speak up, speak up. It's the Spanish. They've come here. Spanish. Spanish. Are you sure? And they've landed and set fire to Master Nevin's cavern up to shore. There's our answer. It's true. Spain proved to be our foe. Now we must act at once. And I say we go south to Crotan. We have no time to lose. Gather up your belongings and go to the boats. Remember. Remember, we go only to return. The colony must not be lost. Never. 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 But John. John, we're not giving up Roanoke. Someday, somehow, we'll come back. We too. Here we stand upon the outpost of the world. The last survivors. Keepers of a dream. Together. And all this hardship and desolation and death sit lightly on me when I think of you. John, I know. My dear, I've always known. Eleanor, tonight I feel somehow it was meant to be this way. This way. Yes. Yes, there's no one but us now, John. And if in God's wisdom... We live our days forgotten and deserted by the world. I will have no regret. None. Nor I, Eleanor. John. John, even if we die, we win. Come. Come, my dear. Let's follow the others. John. John, before we go, let us carve the word Crotan on a stockade post. So my father will find it when he returns. And whatever our fate, let us take courage, John, in the hope that we will not be forgotten, none of us, and that these shores one day shall know of us and keep our dream, the dream of a free people, as we shall keep it, keep it to the end. English colony on these shores disappeared into the vast unknown and became the lost colony. Their only trace, the word Crotan, carved on a stockade post for others to find years later. But they have not passed from our memory nor from the scroll of the immortals in the cavalcade of America. our thanks and congratulations for her moving portrayal of Eleanor Dare and for being our guest tonight on the Cavalcade of America. Ladies and gentlemen, for five years, the DuPont Company has presented as a regular feature of these programs stories about chemistry and the part it plays in our daily lives. Tonight, once again, we bring you another story from the wonder world of chemistry. We sometimes take the good things of life too casually. We snap on the electric light and forget Thomas Edison's long years of dogged, discouraging toil. We scratch a match carelessly 
and forget the 50 years safety matches took to win a place for themselves after Lundstrom first made them in 1855. So with cellophane cellulose film. How did we manage to get along without it, we wonder. And there our wondering ends. Few of us realize that we have it, making our lives healthier, easier, and pleasanter, because for over 30 years, brains, effort, patience, and faith have been poured into its development. For it was over 30 years ago, in 1908, that a Swiss chemist, Dr. J.A. Brandenburger, developed machines for making this now famous transparent film, for which he coined the term cellophane as his trademark. Soon, smart shops abroad were displaying costly perfume in this new and glamorous wrapping. A little later, it made its bow to this country as a wrap on expensive candy packages. The cellophane was expensive, too. In fact, when DuPont turned out the first American-made sheets in 1924, it was the practice of some users to lock up their stock of cellophane in the safe every night. A single pound then cost $2.65. As sales increased, production savings made possible a lower price, and DuPont inaugurated a price policy which, over the next 15 years, brought 20 such reductions. Today, the same type of cellophane that once cost $2.65 sells for 33 cents per pound. Bakers were among the first American businessmen to use cellophane. They wrapped cakes in it, and that brought to light the first of many cellophane problems. Moisture in the cakes evaporated, and they lost their freshness. For the DuPont chemists, it meant an entirely new job. It took two years of hard work and 2,000 experiments to solve the moisture-proofing problem. With increasing use came other problems. For instance, the problem of working with machine manufacturers to develop high-speed precision wrapping machines so that this film, less than one one-thousandth of an inch thick, could be quickly and securely wrapped around cigars, and crackers, hard candy, and countless other products of various types. The need for a kind of film which could be easily sealed led to many more months of research. Finally, heat sealing cellophane was perfected. If you remember when cellophane first came out, you will remember it seemed to appear everywhere almost overnight. Well, it didn't. It came to us only after science and business, working together under our American system of private enterprise, had put millions of venture dollars and more than 30 years of hard study on it. There is another reason why we have cellophane. We have it in the final analysis because the American public was willing to try something new. That, too, was a necessity before the chemists could fulfill the DuPont pledge better things for better living through chemistry. And now we present the star of next week's program, John McIntyre. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to tell you about our broadcast next week. A few years ago, Maxwell Anderson dramatized the story of George Washington in his play, Valley Forge. He has now adapted it for radio, and the Cavalcade of America is especially proud to present Valley Forge on next week's program. It will be my very humble privilege on this occasion to play the part of George Washington. Thank you and good night. On tonight's broadcast, the orchestra and musical effects were under the direction of Don Voorhees and the chorus by Ken Christie. And now for all of us, our star, Loretta Young, the cavalcade players, and myself, good night and best wishes from DuPont. <laughs> <laughs>